in all angles. The National Identification and Registration Act passed in a hurry, challenged in court. On Friday, a bombshell ruling. The law struck down. Why? And what happens now? And yes, what happens now? And joining me in studio to talk through those issues, we have attorney at law and lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Andre Shekelford. Also with us, leader of opposition business in the Senate, Donna Scott Motley, who was a part of the opposition's legal team in this matter, as well as Queen's Counsel, Ian Wilkinson. Before we go to our guests, though, let's go to this overview by my colleague, Herman Green. The year 2000, the Y2K computer scare that fizzled out, the Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia, and guess what else? A national registration bill tabled in Parliament. Since then, about every two years, some movement on this national ID thrust. 2006, Cabinet withdraws the bill for redrafting. 2008, Cabinet again returns to NIDS. 2011, the Prime Minister's office takes over NIDS from the Ministry of Health and a $670,000 US dollar grant was secured. But NIDS seemed closer to reality in 2016 when Andrew Holness tabled the NIDS white paper in Garden House. Seven months later, Mr. Holness opened the debate on the bill. Now is the time to cease talking and to act on this vital tool for the betterment of the people of Jamaica. But pushback was strong. The church and others didn't like it. Withdraw the bill, allow for proper ventilation of the issues over a three-month period even. I reject the view that somehow you have a higher moral authority on this matter than I. I am not here to create a system that is going to deprive Jamaicans of their freedom. The parliamentary opposition was vehement in its disapproval. Be it resolved that the national identification and registration bill 2017 be withdrawn, sent to a joint select committee along with the required regulations relating to critical operational issues. When the government pushed ahead, Dr. Peter Phillips led his MPs in a walkout. Mr. Holness pressed on, insisting that Jamaica needed NIDS. The argument seemed to suggest that I come to Parliament and all of us here come to Parliament to somehow deprive Jamaican citizens of their rights. My life work, Mr. Speaker, has been to expand the rights of the Jamaican citizens. The opposition took its grouse to the media. The bill should be withdrawn and referred to a stand to a joint select committee. The bill was passed in the lower house with 100 amendments. Two months later, more red ink from the upper house. 184 changes. We still have disagreement with some of the clauses and they are fundamental. There are potentially great things to be had from this bill. Then, in December, Jamaica got the loan it needed to set up NIDS, 68 million US dollars from the Inter-American Development Bank. On May 8, 2018, PNP General Secretary Julian Robinson filed an action in the Supreme Court seeking declarations that sections of the National Identification and Identification Act, NIRA, are unconstitutional. From October 22 to 24, 2018, the court hears Robinson's challenge. Attorney General Marlene Malahu Fort led the government's legal team. Former Solicitor General Michael Hilton argued for the opposition. The government announced that NID's implementation was pushed back, but money was being spent just the same. A public education campaign was rolled out while other related contracts were being issued, all while the country awaited a ruling. Friday, April 12, 2019, was Judgment Day. The court ruled that sections of the NIRA were unconstitutional and struck down the whole act. We're of the view that the National Identification and Registration Act is to be declared null and void and of no legal effect. The main reasons? The violation of privacy and inadequate safeguards of data. So enabling now the state to pull together a vast amount of information about the citizen and in effect put itself in a position to derive new information and new knowledge by this combination of information now. 
Okay, and just a, just, just a point. Obviously, the Chief Justice did, did not deliver his judgment by telephone, um, but for the first time ever by live stream, which was awesome because I was able to stay at home and listen to the <laughs> ruling being delivered. Um, let me ask you first, though, to comment. There's so much in this ruling, 309 pages, um, and I won't even ask all of you if you've mined all 309 yet, but to start perhaps with the importance of the chart of rights as it came out in this judgment. And the Chief Justice in particular seems to have made a point of speaking about the importance of the charter and how it um, pr protects the rights of citizens. And especially, let me ask you QC first, especially in a country in which in recent times we've had so many people saying, I'm willing to give up my rights, yes. you know, in the interest of law and order or national security or what have you. The Chief Justice seems to have drawn a line and yes. say, we're here to protect your rights, and the Charter is here to do that. Very well. Well, um, good evening to you, Mrs. Jackson Miller, to my fellow panelists, and to the viewers. And I must say, just before I answer your question, that it's a pleasant surprise for me to see my panelists in these colors. Um, it is a blatant um, coincidence, beautiful <laughs> coincidence. Um, Kingston College having been 94 years old yesterday, oh and that is why I'm celebrating too. Um, I I'll allow you that. Thank you so much. <laughs> This, I'd like to emphasize, this is the boss. This is the constitution of Jamaica. All Jamaicans, whether they can read or write, whether they have been to university or not, they should know about this document. This is bigger than the prime minister. It's bigger than the governor general. It's bigger than the chief justice. It's bigger than all of us. This is what allows people to walk the streets without being attacked willy-nilly, although you still have crime but this allows us to breathe the air with some degree of comfort. This is what the court did on Friday in terms of respecting this sacred document or instrument. We have had human rights enshrined in the Constitution before this charter about which a lot has been said. Um, roughly eight years ago, the Constitution was, a, a, was overhauled in that respect in that we have what one would call now a brand new charter of rights. Um, the Constitutional Court or the full court gave due recognition to the importance, the hallowed nature of all those rights and made it abundantly or eminently clear that no parliament can trespass on this hallowed sacred document when it is passed in laws. And in doing so, it has strengthened this constitution even more. What happened on the, the 12th of April was not merely this tracking down of what we have called NIDS, which is strictly speaking the NIRA Act, but the strengthening and the recognition of the supremacy of our number one law, the Constitution. So I was quite pleased with the judgment, particularly having regard to the fact that the Jamaican Bar Association, of which I am a part, even though I'm no longer on the Bar Council, but of which I am a part, um, had expressed tremendous concerns that the rights of citizens were being trampled on, whether deliberately intended or not. But as we know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we were quite pleased with the outcome. And congratulations to all concerned, even the, even the government attorneys, because they were an important part of the process. And a court hearing usually has two sides being ventilated and assisting the court, and that is how you usually have good law being developed. Andre Shackelford, let me ask you, for, for my viewers who may have said, but I don't understand, the government and the Prime Minister, as we saw, say, hold on, we're protecting your rights, and, and we intend to help Jamaica with this law. So how do we get to a situation where we have a court saying, no, it can't stand? Well, as learned Queen Counsel and my learned friend stated, um, the road to hell, that proverbial road to head, hell, often paved with good intentions. And oftentimes governments act in a manner where they're seeking to protect citizens or enhance citizens' welfare, enhance um, how business is conducted, etc. <clears throat> States oftentimes have very good intentions and governments oftentimes have very good intentions. Um, oftentimes when you pursue one path, some other interest is being undermined in some way. And as we have it here, the state had an interest in providing a reliable means of identification. And in the meantime, privacy was being trespassed upon. Um, perhaps 
the government and the learned prime minister didn't quite appreciate what was taking place, didn't quite appreciate the privacy implications, and why that is is a matter that we can discuss on and on and on for a very long time. But the fact is that privacy was being undermined, as well as equality, as well as a host of other rights within the Constitution. And it just happens, states do things, sometimes states, governments, parliaments, does things which are contrary to the Constitution, contrary to the fundamental rights which are to be protected. Um, once again, I don't doubt that there was some good intention behind what was being sought, but at the same time, interests have to be balanced, and the interest of individual citizens can't be pushed back. It can't be be relegated to something of little or no importance. Even if they say I'm willing to do Even that? Even if they say I'm willing. And um, that's actually a very interesting view because um, in England right now, there are lots of discussions about willing to give up this and willing to give up that mm -hmm. in the interest of certain um, things being put forward. Um, oftentimes the risks are migration. People think that too much immigration is undermining certain things and the general feeling is that when people start to give up their rights, you give way to an author authoritarian or fascist state. Uh, same thing in the United States. People are willing to give up certain things because they think, if I give it up, it doesn't affect me at all. But it so does. the court is saying, will. I'm protecting you from yourself. I most definitely think so. And that <laughs> is the role of courts. Okay. I, I would say that is very much the role of courts. We're going to come back to that issue and pick up on so many more when we come back. Remember our hashtag, it's TVJ All Angles. So come.